So good evening, how are you guys doing? So I am an assistant professor and a third year resident at Duke University. I'm sure some of you in the audience can diagnose that pathology. <laughs> and my goal tonight is to talk to you a little bit about the work that we do in the lab uh, to understand how changes in neurocircuit, neuro neurocircuit function lead to neuropsychiatric disorders. Since this is a talk about stress, I thought I would start with my most stressful slide. <laughs> So as an outline for what I'll be talking about tonight, I'll talk about the, the, the problem with the current framework for how we think about neuropsychiatric illness um, and, and how an evolution in that framework may lead us to a better understanding of how neurocircuits participate in these disorders. And finally, if we can get this understanding of how neurocircuits participate in these disorders, can we move into a framework where we can now predict illness and prevent it instead of worrying about treating symptoms? So neuropsychiatric illness in its simplest form, and I don't need to spend too much time here with this audience, is based on dysfunctional human behavior, right? And these disorders are based on these subjective categories of, of symptoms that show up. And as a result of that, as a result of our lack of, of a knowledge of the understanding by underlying biology, most of our treatments focus on reducing symptoms and not really focusing on cures. As a, as a bit of an example, I put this slide on the board. It's the most busy slide you'll ever see. It's busy on purpose. It's a diagnosis of depression. There are nine behavioral categories. You have to have one of the first two, the diminished interest or poor mood, and then five out of the other nine categories that you see on the board. And, and so as an example of how complicated and, and challenging it is to think about this as a biological illness from a biological standpoint, I'll tell you about one of my first days in residency. So I walk in, in I'm an engineer by background. I was a chemical engineer. I work at, walk into the clinic, uh, the inpatient unit, uh, my first day as a resident, and I, and I have a patient. And the patient is a 21-year-old guy who just figured out his, his fiance had had an affair. And so he comes in with these suicidal thoughts and suicidal behaviors. He's had some weight loss over time, decreased concentration, he's having problems sleeping, and this loss of interest in the things that he typically does. And so we diagnose him with depression. On the other hand, I have another patient, it's a 66-year-old female who comes in who's been having these ruminations of all these things that happened in her 20s. She's got poor mood, she's sleeping too much, she's got these feelings of worthlessness, moving particularly slow and fatigued, and she gets diagnosed with depression. So this for me, as from my scientific and engineering background, I have a really hard time processing this. I have these two individuals, they have no overlapping symptoms whatsoever, and they get the same diagnosis. In, in fact, so I gave this talk at APA several weeks ago, and someone emailed me this paper uh, right afterwards where they'd taken all the possible combinations of ways that you can get depression. It ends up being 1,497. So we've got all these possible combinations of having manifestations that lead to this common illness. And at some point in time, I was really struggling with this question, is what we're diagnosing the equivalent of diagnosing a fever, right? And, and so we've, we've got a fever that can be due to a bacterial illness, a viral illness, an autoimmune disorder, a heat stroke. And in all of these cases, the appropriate treatment, whether it works or not, is based on the underlying reason why you have the fever. And so unless we can get closer to the neurocircuitry and the understanding of the brain, we, I don't think we're ever gonna get to a point where we can always have treatments that have 100% efficacy or getting anywhere near it because in most cases we're probably matching the wrong treatment with the wrong person. So the work we do in the lab is based on implanting electrodes into the brains of mice. Each of these electrodes is the size of a piece of hair, about 30 microns. We implant arrays of these, so multiple arrays and bundles into the brains of animals. And what we're able to do in the lab is target multiple brain areas simultaneously during surgery. And when the animals recover from surgery, we can record their brain activity as they're awake and behaving and performing different tasks. And I won't spend too much time today talking about some of our genetic models. What I'll spend the majority of the time talk, talking, talk, talk talking about is some of the inbred mice. So these are mice that are, in theory, show up genetically identical into the lab. Because I think it teaches a lot about the real challenges that lay ahead of us. So the, the, a, a brief primer in terms of the data we get, the first type of data that I'll spend time talking about is the local field potential. These are waves of electrical activity. These are the same sort of things that you see when you have EEGs or scalp electrodes, except these are recorded from the tip of a wire implanted into the brain. Within these waves, there's oscillatory activity at different frequencies that comprise each of these waves that we record. We can record from many brain activity, brain areas simultaneously in a mouse. And so you'll hear me talking about the local field potential today. The second thing you'll hear me talking about is synchrony. This is how two waves oscillate together across time. This is the same sort of principle that's used in functional connectivity when you're talking about imaging research. It's based on this principle that waves that oscillate together across time are thought to lie within the same neurocircuit within the brain. 
The second type of information that I'll talk about is the unit activity. So this is the discrete firing of individual cells that we can record. These are just examples of cells, of waveforms, action potentials that we've recorded in the brain. When I do say discrete, that means it either fires or doesn't. So it's a zero or one. This is an example just showing a simultaneously recorded neuron from striatum. And you see a line here every time the neuron fires. I've shown the local field potential recorded from the same wire. And what you see in this case is that the neuron will tend to fire at a specific phase of the oscillatory cycle. So there's coupling between when the neuron fires and the phase of the cycle. That's called phase locking. And so this neuron tends to fire most at the, the peak of this oscillation here. So this is the type of information that I'll spend time talking about today. So stress in neural circuits. I became particularly interested in stress because as I kept seeing patients come into the ward and come into the ward, irrespective of what their diagnosis was, whether it was an addictive disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, the common piece, the common link between all these disorders was that they got worse in the face of stress, they were exacerbated by stress, the onset was related to stress as well. And so if I could understand that mechanism that led to the common triggering of these illnesses in the brain, perhaps we can skip all of the diagnosis and focus on that common trigger mechanism and come up with a, a common treatment. So the model that we use in the lab, it's a chronic social subordination stress model. It was used in many labs in the world, really brought to form in Eric Nestler's lab at Mount Sinai. The way the model works is you have your mouse of interest. It's this wonderful inbred, uh, genetically identical C57 mouse. And we put it in the cage with a much bigger aggressor mouse that's been housed in that cage for several days. And so what immediately happens is the aggressor mouse attacks the poor, innocent C57 mice, mouse, and we let this encounter go on for about five to 10 minutes. After the five to 10 minutes, the C57 mouse is put on the opposite side of the cage, and it's housed in sensory contact with the animal for 24 hours. At the end of that 24 hours, we take the C57 mouse out, put it in a new cage with a new aggressor mouse, and this experience is repeated for 15 days. So it sees 15 animals, 15 new aggressor animals, has an aggressive encounter over 15 days. And at the end of this process, these animals, these C57 animals, have decreased interest in sucrose and sex, anxiety-like symptoms, hyperactivity of the HPA axis, disrupted circadian rhythms and metabolic syndrome, and profound social avoidance. So this has been used as a model of depression and PTSD. Chronic treatment with antidepressants reverses aspects of this syndrome, not acute treatment. So we wanted to come up with a, a, a measure in the lab, taking advantage of this neurophysiology, that matches some measures that have been described in humans. So what I'm showing you here is an aggressive faces task, just showing you some uh, imaging, fMRI, functional MRI, recordings, uh, images in amygdala, and just showing that in the case of exposing someone to uh, emotionally charged face, there's activation in this brain region. So we wanted to design a task in animals where we can extract the same amount of information since we were recording neurophysiological measures as our output, right? So in this case, we're not primarily concerned with the animal's behavior response. We want to know about its neurophysiological circuit response. So the task that we described, we took the C57 mouse, we put it upside down in this uh, basically a pencil holder, and we recorded its brain activity. After about five minutes upside down, in that upside down pencil holder, we introduced an aggressive CD1 mouse on the outside of this. So this is an extremely aggressive strain of mice. When they come in the lab, we screen them for the most aggressive of this aggressive strain of mice. So this is a, 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 an animal that takes about four seconds to attack any C57 mouse in its environment. It's about 50% bigger than the C57 mouse as well. So we want to know what happens to the brain response when it sees this, this threatening animal. And the way the task works, again, we record it for five minutes while the C57 mouse is in this cage upside down. These recordings are done after chronic stress. And then we see what happens to its brain when we introduce this C57, this aggressor CD1 mouse into the environment. And so we're recording activity from prefrontal cortex and amygdala. I'm just showing you two LFP traces before and after the introduction of the aggressor mouse. What you see in the middle is this little trick that we can play with the neurophysiology. Since these waves, we're saying they lie within the same circuit, we can measure that by how they're oscillating together across time. What we can do is shift these waves relative to each other and see if the coupling or the, the oscillatory nature gets better or worse. And this allows us to extract directionality from the circuit. So from there, we can find the frequency band at which there's what we would call top-down or cortical control where prefrontal cortex is preceding amygdala, right in this frequency band that's about two to seven hertz, and that's where this circuit synchronizes the best. So that's what you see here. This is how these two areas synchronize with each other. This is the time lag of the synchrony, of the directionality, and we'll focus the rest of the talk on this two to seven hertz oscillation.
So here's what we see. This is in terms of the unit responses. The first thing we do is we ask, is this oscillation something that's traveling across the brain, or is it actually locally relevant to these two brain areas, prefrontal cortex and amygdala? And we can do that by asking, do the single neurons fire in relationship to the oscillation in this part of the brain? So we find about 30% of our neurons in prefrontal cortex fire in relationship to the, the two to seven hertz oscillation in prefrontal cortex. This is an example of phase locking again. And about 30% of the neurons in amygdala fire in relationship to the oscillation in amygdala as well. So both of these signals are locally relevant. Interestingly enough, when we separate this based on before the, an the aggressor animals are introduced to the arena and afterwards, we see that the coupling to this oscillation in PFC is diminished when it sees the aggressor. And then the coupling of the neurons in amygdala is increased when it sees the, the aggressor. So the amygdala tends to tune into this oscillation. The prefrontal cortex tends to tune out of this oscillation. What you see here on the bottom is we're just asking, of these neurons in prefrontal cortex that tune to the prefrontal cortex oscillation, do they best tune to the past oscillation, the current oscillation, or the future oscillation? And we see that the neurons in prefrontal cortex best couple to the ongoing prefrontal oscillation, which is what we'd expect. And the neurons in amygdala best couple to the past PFC oscillation. So there's directionality that we can measure at that level as well. And when we introduce the, the aggressor mouse, what happens with these amygdala neurons is they lose their coupling to the prefrontal oscillation. So this is where we start, right? This is taking all of our animals that have been stressed. Now, one thing that I didn't mention, and I, I bring this into the talk now, is that when we put animals through this chronic stress paradigm, there's actually different populations that emerge on the other side of this. So we have a population of animals that even after that stress paradigm, they don't show the behavioral responses that I mentioned before. So this is an example of how these things are classically scored. This is the choice interaction test. What you do is you measure the amount of time the C57 mouse spends in a zone of an arena when it's empty. Then a CD1 mouse is placed in it, and you measure how much the same C57 mouse spends in that zone. So the, there's a population of animals when the CD1 is introduced, the C57 mice basically hide in the corner. There's another population of mice that go and explore the CD1 mouse. This is a distribution of what happens in this task in animals that have not been stressed. And of the animals that are stressed, you see the, this population has been split to a group of animals that spend more time interacting with the zone when the CD1 is in there and less time interacting with the, the CD1 when the animal's in there. Now, this has been characterized. This phenotype has been shown to also correlate with how much they like sugar. So it isn't just this avoidance. It goes along with other things. It goes along with changes in gene expression in VTA. There's a, a paper in Science about three weeks ago, exploring some of these phenomenon as well. So this is a global change that happens that people have classically pulled out with this task. So we're able to do the same thing in our animals that have been recorded. We can also do this exact same behavioral task. In, in the light white color, you see the animals that are non-stressed and how much time they spend interacting is a ratio. Again, one means they interact more. And in the animals that have been stressed, you can see the same sort of distribution to animals that decrease their interaction time and animals that show higher interaction time as well. So we have their brain response to this stressor and we have their behavioral response to this stressor. And then we want to ask, do these things correlate? in any way, shape, or form. So here's what you see. This is a picture of coherence or synchronization of oscillatory activity. Um, red meaning high synchrony between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Blue meaning lower synchrony between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. This is before introduction of the aggressor mouse, and this is afterwards. And this is that animal right there. So across our population of animals, what you're seeing on the x-axis is how their brain responds to seeing the aggressor mouse in terms of coupling between these areas. And on the x-axis, what you see is their behavioral response. And what we found was there was a really clear correlation between this neurophysiological response that we were recording in their brain and the behavioral response to chronic stress that you see on the other side. We can also see this if we just think about the, if we look at the oscillations of each of the areas alone. So now we're not asking questions about how they relate to each other, we're asking about them alone. And again, in prefrontal cortex, we see that there's this increase in power in prefrontal cortex in the animals that end up being extremely susceptible to stress or showing this behavioral response, and the same thing in amygdala. So this correlation is present both in how these couple with each other and each of the individual areas alone. So we now found this neurophysiological correlate of how these animals respond behaviorally to stress. Again, I Mind you that these animals are inbred C57 mice and they are genetically identical that we're getting from Jackson Labs.
So then we wanted to ask this simple question. We've got what we think is this feed-forward control circuit, where there's activity in pre prefrontal cortex. The activity is sending, there's this descending signal into amygdala that we think is synapsing on inhibitory neurons, and then suppressing the rest of the activity in amygdala by increasing the output of these inhibitory neurons. So we wanted to test this hypothesis, and we'll we took advantage of a technique, and, I and I'll get into this in the next slide, where we can activate these inhibitory neurons that receive projections from prefrontal cortex using what are called designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. And, and briefly what they are, are these are receptors, they're cholinergic receptors, muscarinic cholinergic receptors that have been mutated so they don't bind acetylcholine. They only bind an inert compound, in this case, CNL. And so what we can do is by expressing these on a specific cell type, when we inject this compound systemically, it causes increased calcium release in the cell, and the cells basically burst or are activated. So we can turn on a specific cell type using this viral expression pattern. So the goal here is then to turn on these cells in amygdala that receive projections from prefrontal cortex. So what we do is we put an anterior grade tracer into prefrontal cortex. It's hooked up to Cree recombinase, and I'll get back, I'll get into that in a second how it works. But this virus is basically travels down the axon and is expressed postsynaptically in amygdala. And the Cree recombinase is expressed in the cells in amygdala that make contact with prefrontal cortex. We put in this dread compound. The dread compound, the way it's read, we flip it around such that only in the presence of Cree is it flipped back to normal and expressed. So what you wind up with is all of the cells in amygdala that interact with prefrontal cortex can then express this activating receptor. And you can see these are examples of inhibitory neurons in amygdala that express this receptor. So we have animals that express the receptor and our control animals are just labeled with GFP or a fluorescent protein. So the experiment is we, in, we infect the, the animals before stress, we stress them out, after stress, we determine if they're in the susceptible or the resilient group, and then we turn on this receptor and we see what happens to them behaviorally. So again, this is the distribution that we're talking about. We have animals that are resilient to stress, so the first thing we did was we excluded them. You can see there's an interaction time at which all you see are blue animals, about right here. So we take our same distribution of animals after stress and we exclude all the animals that are resilient to stress. So we're dealing with the animals, only the animals that are susceptible to stress, Half of them express this GFP, or this fluorescent control protein. The other half express the dread receptor, and you can see that their behavior of the stressed animals are exactly the same. Then we give them the drug, turn on this receptor, and test them again. What you see in the single house control animals, when you turn on this receptor, no change. All of the animals spend much more time interacting with that zone when you turn on the receptor. In the animals that have been chronically stressed that express the control virus, they have interaction ratios less than one. In other words, they run and hide in the corner. And in the animals you turn on this receptor, they start interacting again. So we can recover normal behavior by targeting these cells in amygdala and turning them on. So that was pretty intriguing. And, and then the real question became, was there anything in the circuitry of these animals before stress that said which way they were going to go in response to chronic stress. Again, these are genetically inbred animals that come in from Jackson Labs. It hasn't been, the field has really wrestled with it for a while, asking if there was a different experience of stress that caused these different phenotypes to emerge, or if animals actually started off different. And because of the neurophysiology, we had an ability to answer that question. So what I didn't mention was that we also did a forced interaction test before stressing them out and can look at their brain response in that situation as well. So again, this is their response in terms of the synchrony between these two areas before stress. You can see that there's no correlation between their post-stress behavior and their pre-stress brain response. Same thing in amygdala, although it starts trending in that direction. What we found in PFC was a very clear, very strong correlation between how their PFC responded to that aggressor mouse before stress and their behavioral response after stress. So what we did was we then wanted to ask questions what is this oscillation? What is this response in PFC? And what does it tell us about the underlying makeup of the animals? So the final thing we did was we took about 50 animals, so we doubled the number of animals, we put them through this pre-stress test to see how their brain responded, and then we split them into two groups, animals which increased their PFC power before stress, and animals that decreased their PFC power. And then we asked, what are the differences in how their prefrontal cortex is acting? 
And what we can find is that the firing rates in prefrontal cortex of the animals that ended up in this group, the animals that were resilient to stress, they just had much higher firing rates in their PFC. And it was the strongest correlation that we see. I've got about 15 seconds left, so I'll give you the two take-homes from here that I thought are, were really critical and really changed the way we thought about this in the lab. The first one is, these are C57 mice, and they're genetically identical. If we would do a simple test to ask which brain areas encode the acute response to threat, we would be left with amygdala, in which we'd say all of the responses go down, and maybe the coupling between the two. But because these animals go in different directions, we, we would conclude that PFC isn't actually doing anything, which is the first thing. The second thing is this suggested that there's something else, and I'm sure all the developmental neurobiologists in the room, this is a pretty clear suggestion. There's something that's happening to these animals, probably between birth and them showing up in the lab, that results in some sort of epigenetic changes in the way their prefrontal cortex is working that sets them up in the position of how they respond to stress when they see it one way or another. But we think this is exactly the sort of target that we need to be doing to develop these diagnostics, right? If we can figure out how folks will go in response to stress and figure out what mediates that, then that's what we can target, that biomarker. So and again, in conclusion, uh, the circuit function re reflects uh, this behavioral disturbance. We can modify this circuit and change behavioral responses after stress. And there's this PFC dysfunction in the circuit that reflects their basal trait vulnerability to stress. So here's the folks that did the work. Uh, we had some collaborators out at Stanford and UNC. You guys, I'm sure, know most of these people. And uh, the two postdocs in my lab who really led this work. And I'll highlight the two last undergrads in the lab who are now in MSTP programs, one at Duke, headed off to Duke, and one going off to UVA. So if there are any undergrads who are interested in rotating with the lab, please see me. Thank you. <laughs>